Circuit 42 would like to thank Pop Culture Paradise, Toy Anxiety, The Spawn Point Gamers Lounge, and Dragon's Lair San Antonio. All right, uh, welcome to the newest episode of Circuit 42 Presents, and we are here with Alex Jowski of Geek Juice Media. Hello! How are you How are you doing tonight, Jowski? I'm really good tonight. Thank you. <laughs> how are you doing? I'm doing good, doing good. Just been busy uh, working a lot. Um, I finally started watching Cosmos since everyone's been telling me to watch it, and I've just been busy and lazy. What, like the, the, the science show? Yeah, it's really good. The uh, new one. I have not seen it yet. It's uh, it's basically Neil deGrasse Tyson talking science, and the uh, way Neil deGrasse uh, or whatever his name is, Tyson. That, that's how you know you're a badass scientist when your last name is Tyson. But yeah. He's, he's going to punch space, and hopefully not bite into here. I was watching episodes of Nova the other day, so... Nice. Um, but yeah, they basically take the old idea of Cosmos and, you know, with Carl Sagan, except with modern use of technology and CG to completely visualize everything that he's talking about as he's talking about it. That's pretty neat. It is really cool. They've got the first season on Netflix. I will check it out. I didn't know they had the season on Netflix. Yep. So, for those who don't know, who are you and what do you do? I'm Alex Jowski. I run geekjuicemedia.com. Um, it's a site dedicated to geek culture, uh, mostly movies, although we are still trying to expand to more topics. Uh, a lot of movies and cartoon, well, anime, and comics and video games, things like that. Um but mostly movies, it's the core of Geek Juice Media is me, Charlie McMullen, and Mr. X. And it's not necessarily just movie reviews. I mean, that's what it initially started as. Lately, it's become more of a um, discussion of movies. Not reviews, but discussion about movies and things like that. You know, presenting a movie, discussing it, getting what people think about it, and presenting different ideas about movies and film theory and things like that. I Now, a quick question. I I come from a um, – I studied film in college, and I'm pretty sure that you did as well. Yes, I did. Now, um, when it when it comes to the pod, when it comes to podcasts on film, now this is not to sound pretend towards people who didn't come from that film background coming in, but do you think – how much of a difference do you think it makes, you know, having someone who studied film as opposed to someone who just, you know – may not have the technical background, but just really likes movies. It depends on the the topic, actually. I mean, I mean, you get the film school stuff, and there are certain one movies that are film school standards, and you get all the talk of theory. You know, all the the like Sid Field three act structure of a screenplay and things like that. But if you got somebody that just likes movies, they've picked up on that through osmosis. So they know it. They just don't know the right words for it. And it kind of comes out the same because, honestly, film school, you can learn both by, A, watching and analyzing a lot of movies and actually working on a set. It will teach you everything you need to know that you get in film school. So it kind of comes about the same. If somebody really has a deep passion for movies, they already know everything that film school could teach them. I know that, um, what is it, um, Own Citizen from Tig, from, uh, Tig with Tig, like he recently started, he's recently working on a project now where he's going to be explaining, like, film, like, exact film terminology for people who didn't have that kind of background, for people who, like you said, just are really passionate about films. So they can know exactly, you know, the kind of information that you would learn in film school and how to apply, you know, the kind of words, apply, kind of phrases that basically mean, you know, like different camera, different camera shots, different technical ideas. And I think it's really cool to see people doing that. Uh, I'll be interested in seeing what Kyle has to say about it. Now, um, one of the things I, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and probably the first series I started watching on your website 
was uh, Creation Cinema. Oh, Creation Videos. Creation Videos. I'm dumb. Yeah, I'm very, very proud of Creation Videos. I, I just I like it because you know, like with everything on the on the with like with everything on the website, it's half a history lesson and half you know the review and comedy, etc. But it doesn't always focus on comedic aspects of movies like a lot of online reviews. I long ago was away from the comedic aspects because I realized that I had I got more out of a review. You know, I enjoyed discussing the movie more by actually discussing the movie, discussing its context, and discussing its history. Maybe make a few jokes along the way, but. Unlike a lot of other reviewers out there who put humor first, I put the discussion of the film first. And then if there's a joke that presents itself in that process, I'll, I'll happily take it. But humor is second to actually discuss in movies. And with creation videos, what happened is because it actually spun off of antisocial commentary, I had reviewed this movie called, oh God, what was it? Art of the Devil. And it was this Thai film. And I'm like, well, I think I want to do a series of where I just look at Asian movies like this one. And that's what started Creation Videos, which is short for Crazy Asian. And I've been having a lot, lot of fun with Creation Videos. It allows me to creatively express myself a lot more than any other series I do. So I've got to ask, what's your favorite and what's your least favorite that you movie that you've had to review on uh, Creation Nation videos? Creation uh, videos. Creation. I'm, I'm not. My sure. favorite. My favorite is just about any Godzilla movie. The ones I, especially the Godzilla movies I really like, Godzilla vs. King Ghidorah, Godzilla vs. Mothra. Those are ones that really have a significant place in my heart. Those are the ones I like. Ones that I've had a. a a tough time with. Um, oh God, I'd actually have to look at an episode listing for that. Was it um, Echo Shark? Oh, that Jaws in Japan, that shark movie. That one. That one took forever to watch because it's a. Um, it's not even a shark movie. Well, it's a, a metaphorical shark movie, I guess. There is a predator after those girls. Um, it was di it was difficult to watch because it was just these girls talking most of the time, and kept saying "kawaii, kawaii," and it has that WTF ending where just random shark comes and kills everybody. I'd say one. Hardest ones that I had to write, which actually I have not posted it yet, is this movie called Tamagotchi. That's actually two episodes down the line. I wrote it and I'm still editing it, but it's this weird Hong Kong ghost story, which it's interesting, although it keeps throwing child nudity at me, and I'm like, no, stop that. I'm so just picturing you talking to the talking to the movie as you go. I'm just saying no, no, stop that, and having like a newspaper just pop on the TV. Oh, I do. My 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 ex, who's also my roommate, she comes in all the time. Are you talking to a person or a movie? A movie right now? Oh, okay. Because I I do talk to the movies the way I do in those reviews. So I'm like, no movie, no, stop this. I still think my favorite that you've done, and the movie that I recently showed to my friends, which confused them and has become their point of reference for why I should not show as many movies, which they're clearly wrong, is uh, Tokyo Gore Police. Tokyo Gore Police was a good one. That I think that was like the first time I actually put my daughter on screen, which... Um, a lot, I got comments on that one where I had to tell them, no, I did not have her watch Tokyo Gore Police. I just put the camera on her and said, laugh and cry, you know. She never watched Tokyo Gore Police, but that's what I went for for the effect for that video. Tokyo Gore Police is, is a good one, actually. I really like that movie. I did that back during, uh, I was doing a month about dystopia. 
That's when you know your kid's a good actor. When you have them laugh and cry, just tell them to laugh and cry, and then everyone thinks you're, like, the worst parent of the world. It's difficult to do, actually, man. You know, kid actors are the worst thing to work with, and it's... Like, I shot an entire review that was a crossover with my daughter that never got posted because it is so difficult to work with kids. And anybody working on film sets will tell you that kid actors are the most difficult thing to work with, and I completely understand why. That's why my daughter gets a random cameo every now and again, because even that cameo is hour, hour and a half worth of work just for one line. Now, one of the things I want to talk about, you mentioned, um, you mentioned, uh, you, you, you briefly touched on Geek Juice Radio, and recently I've gotten really into the show. Like, I've been listening to a lot of the, um, director, re- director retrospectives. And for oh, those, no. oh, sorry. The director retrospectives have been going great. So, for those who don't know, you're actually, and I slowly started to realize this, because I can alphabet, but you've been doing these in alphabetical order. And what made you, was it just an organization thing, or what made you want to come up with that idea? Well, I, I did want to do like, okay, let's do a director director retrospective every month. And I came up with a long, long list of directors, and I just put them in alphabetical order. And I'm like, it's easy to just go, okay, what's the next one on the list? What's the next one on the list? And it's not quite alphabetical order. Um, it's close enough to alphabetical order because I'll, I'll think of one just like, oh my god, we skipped this person. It, I don't think anybody will notice that it's not the right letter. Like, we did Cronenberg, and now we're doing Coppola, but then another month down the line, we're going back and doing Coscarelli, which theoretically should come before Coppola. Doing two directors out of order? Mm, zero stars. Yeah, it's a roughly alphabetical order. I, I, I thank Brad for my obsessive use of the zero stars meme because zero stars is awesome. Oh, I've used that a lot lately too. It's like I was watching. Um, I, I do I do electronic sales for my main job, and they had we had the Toy Story movies playing on like the big screen because it looks really awesome and it's Toy Story. And first movie's playing, and they, I forgot how wonky the humans look. And so I'm there with my coworker, and I just say, Huh, that CGI from 20 years ago seems slightly dated. Zero stars. <laughs> it does. Uh, Toy Story is good, though. The same guy that um, made Brave Little Toaster, by the way, John Lasseter. Which makes sense when you consider the ending of Toy Story 3. Exactly. So, um, one of the one of the things I wanted to ask about, like, you guys put out new content every single day, pretty much every single day, and as someone who's been running, helping to run a website for a few years, that can be hard to get out content, you know, maybe every three days, every week. How are you able to keep, kind of keep, how are you guys able to keep things organized and get that kind of regular content out there? Actually, the, the way I do it is I've got several different contributors on the site. And they all submit their stuff. And I actually have it on a, a schedule because I try to make sure that everybody has their time in the spotlight. So I'm like, you know, this person gets their hours being the top thing on the site. This person gets so many hours. So um, somebody will submit a video and post it on the site. It may be a good 12 hours or a day before it actually posts on the site. So I have it all, like, scheduled, and it's me and two others that actually moderate and do the schedule. So that's how, actually, stuff gets posted every day. Otherwise, you'd get, like, 10 things on one day and then nothing for the rest of the week, which I don't quite like because from a business standpoint, you want stuff... You want to spam people's feeds. You want to spam people's Facebook feeds and their Twitter feeds if you want to get your site out there. And the most tasteful way of doing that is by spacing out content. So one of the big things I wanted to ask about, because I hate to say it, but about partway through our 
I'd say it's lifespan. We had some really, really bad drama that actually affected our page for a little while, and we're still having to rebuild. Like, I had to find a whole new way to post up material, that sort of thing. And one of the big things I know a lot of sites starting out is uh, the whole separation of, you know, of personal and professional in terms of, like, drama, things that can affect sites. What kind of advice do you have for people when it comes to just kind of dealing with that and being able to separate? The best thing is um, the, don't hire anybody that's under 25. Work like a car insurance company does. Um, because the older somebody gets, the easier it is for them to separate internet life and real life. And that's one thing I like about Geek Juice is that I've been trying to cater towards people that are able to make that distinction and don't bring drama to the site. The other thing is people need to look at it as this is a hobby. You know, there is money involved, but it's still a hobby. And I keep telling people, I'm like, you may make some money at this, but don't look at it as the future. Don't look, don't think of this as a career. I, you know, I want people to keep their regular lives. I'm like, this is a hobby. It's a profitable hobby, but it's still a hobby. And approach it that way, you know, that it, it has all the emotional commitment as building a model car does. And getting people to approach it that way has worked out a lot. So in that regard, you're talking about, you know, bringing on people of a certain age, appealing to people of a certain age, giving them that understanding right from the start and consistently of how, you know, how things would work separate and inside, separating the hobby, make sure that people realize, you know, this is not going to be a lifelong career. Yeah. Uh, the career thing, that was tapped out by Doug Walker. He made a career of it. So... Everybody else, there's so many people that try to follow in his footsteps and try to make a career out of it and get aggravated when they, they're not succeeding at it. You want a perfect example of that? Watch um, Brad Jones' series, The Reviewers, over at the Cinema Snob. It, it shows the whole thing of people trying to make a career out of reviewing movies. It's simply not going to work these days. You're going to have to do a lot more or realize that this is a hobby. Yeah, because it's really that rule of thumb. It's almost unpredictable. You know, if someone will succeed or not, you can't really artificially create that. It's just, you know, who sees what video and who decides to share it. And all, that can have, that that can be like a make it, break it thing. But you can't just artificially create, you know, celebrity in any way. Well, on top of that, and that's what I worry about for a lot of people that, that may be making a lot of money on YouTube and stuff right now is where's the future in it? This may be popular this year and maybe next year, but what are you going to do when it's not? What are you going to do when you're 50? Nobody's going to watch some dude play in Minecraft that's 50 years old. There's, there's no retirement plan involved in it. So it's basically a fact of, I want people that are comfortable with their day-to-day -day job that will continue to do their day job and maybe have some video that they do in their spare time every week or so because I don't want people to give up their lives for the Internet. Exactly. I think – I hate to say it, but like there were, I hate to say it, but, you know, like you were saying, at the same time, it's it's a bubble, like any bubble. Yeah, it's kind of like look at the look at the '90s and the whole internet. You know, the whole um, the whole the whole um, I don't remember the exact phrase I used to describe it, but um, a lot of the internet is like a um, a fishbowl. People find one little thing to obsess upon because, well, oh, there's nothing else today, so I'm gonna pick on this lady on Twitter. In the '90s, you yeah, know, everyone thought that oh, all these internet businesses are going. You know, there's no way that they're ever, the bubble's ever going to pop. And then you look at what happened with a lot of these internet businesses. I mean, even though it was never my favorite episode, the Simpsons episode of Stan Lee with the whole angry dad thing, that summed up a lot of internet business in like the mid to late 90s. 
I don't particularly remember that episode, actually. But oh. there's a billion episodes of The Simpsons. Chances are I missed one or two. <laughs> they make, well, basically, Barton get, makes a cartoon called Angry Dad, and it's part of this internet startup company. And it's very much a riff of like the internet startup companies at the time. And this is really cheap Flash cartoon that gets all of these views. And then, like, a month, like, they keep telling me, oh, this is going to be the greatest thing ever. You're going to be a millionaire. Angry Dad's going to go forever. And then a week later, he comes into the office a week later, and people are walking out with their desk packed, and basically their desk packed away in boxes. And guess what happened? Well, we found out that we actually have to make money. And we oh, found yeah. out we had nothing to sell to make money. So, sorry, kid. But there was that episode of South Park about the viral videos where they poked fun at, you know, the most popular viral videos, like the Tron guy and Chris Cocker and things like that, to where it's like, oh, I've earned all this internet money. And so the fact that, well, there is money in running a website. I mean, and it's mostly ad revenue. But understanding how ads pay and stuff, you need to have just an ungodly amount of views to make it work. That's how sites like BuzzFeed operate, because BuzzFeed gets billions of views a day. And unless you're going to come out the gate with a billion views, you need to address it as a hobby. Exactly. So in, in regards to any kind of future series that you have on the website or any kind of new episodes coming up, because you, I know you mentioned earlier that you were going to be doing the Coppola cast and the um, Coscarelli cast. Yeah, uh, just radio. Well, I've got an interview with David Dakota uh, that I am actually doing this week. It'll air a couple weeks on the site. As far as the director spec is, we've got Coppola, Coscarelli, and Cameron Crowe. That'll finish out the letter C before we move on to, to the letter D. Um, as far as new shows, uh, Charlie McMullen's working on a new sh new show that I'm producing. It's a it's a green friendly show called Theater of High Culture (THC), looking at weed movies. And he's been trying to get a a new show going with me, him, and um. Mr. X, but that that's still in the works. And I I know you mentioned on your Facebook page that you're going to be doing an episode, a uh, new episode of Crazy with the movie Juon, right? Yeah, that's actually coming in the next few days. Are you going it's, to be doing? It? I'm sorry. It's a look at Juon, and also. Comparing it to the American remake and presenting the fact that I actually like the remake better than the original. And presenting my debate for that. Well, I'm kind of I'm kind of mixed on both for different reasons. But I think a lot of people tend to forget that that movie was actually a case of the original director working on both. Oh, it's not only the original director. He uses a lot of the original cast. The ghosts for the the woman and Toshio, those are the same actors from the original. And the original actually spawned from a series of shorts that the director did. But the um, the remake, the thing, the big thing is that the original, it felt like a series of vignettes that were interconnected. The remake actually presents a consistent narrative. It's out of sequence, but it's a consistent narrative that has beginning, middle, and end. And that's one of the big reasons I prefer the remake, actually. It, it does seem like, in some ways, with some remakes, that, you know, people... I think it says we did have a string of really bad remakes, that people forget that you can actually have good ones, just as long as you have somebody who actually, you know, with some exceptions... Like, if you have a director who's really, really passionate about it, you can actually get something really interesting. I mean, there are exceptions, like the Halloween movies, which by Rob Zombie, where he is a huge fan. But I I don't think they're as bad as people say. I think they're only okay. But I think, like I said, I think people tend to throw remakes as a whole under the bus, even though they really shouldn't. I really love the first half hour or so of 
Rob Zombie's Halloween, where it gives all the backstory, and the kid that's playing Michael Myers is actually kind of talented. Um, the rest of the movie I could do without, but that first a half hour, 45 minutes of all the backstory, I really got into it, offered a lot more than John Carpenter's had to say. For Halloween 2, I hate. I can't stand Halloween 2. Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, I mean. The, it's funny you mentioned the scenes with him as a kid, because apparently, I was listening to the commentary for the first movie, because I just recently picked up the box set, and um, Rob Zombie actually said that the scenes with him and with young Michael and, and uh, Dr. Loomis were unscripted. So all the scenes in the hospital were just them improvising and going back and forth. That's actually pretty good, and speaks a lot to, to Malcolm McDowell's talent, because Malcolm McDowell gets a lot of crap, but if he ad-libbed that, that's pretty good, his talent as an actor. I think he's one of those actors, it's a perfect example of a really good actor who just makes them, who, who just sign, who maybe he just cashes a few too many checks, and people tend to forget how good an actor he is. Yeah, he makes a couple awkward decisions, like milk money, for instance. To where, like, what the hell is Malcolm McDowell doing in that movie? Um, I still, still need to watch that Silent Night, Deadly Night that has Malcolm McDowell in it. I, it's, it's sitting on my hard drive waiting for me to watch for the past, like, year and a half. It's actually a really fun movie, and you can tell he's having a blast making it, too. And that's what's important, is if, if the actors are having fun, then I'm having fun, too. That's another thing, because a lot of people look at... Because, like, with antisocial commentary, as show I do on the site, it originally started as, I'm going to make fun of bad movies, and it eventually turned into me discussing film theory and social issues, like, in one show. And... One of the big things I've started to embrace is I'm like, if the actors are having fun, that's the point of the movie. You're supposed to have fun with it kind of thing. And there's a lot of movies where people have made intentionally their intent is for you to have fun. Now, if they follow through on that intent or not, you know, is debatable, but... A lot of people just look at, oh, this is a bad movie, versus this is a bad movie that was intended to be this way, kind of thing. Which is why I look at a lot of films the asylum. So it's, you mentioned that, and one of the things I've always noticed with um, Quentin Tarantino, while he is a polarizing director, I am a huge fan of his movies, that with the exception of... I can't remember. It was one of the actors from uh, Reservoir Dogs. You watch any interviews with anyone who worked on his movies, and they always say that he's one of their favorite people. I know uh, apparently Zoe Bell said that he was her best American friend after working on uh, Grindhouse. And it seems like he's a director who, you know, while he makes his his very uh, you know his very signature style of movies. It seems like he always creates an environment where the actors are actually enjoying themselves, too. He does, because um, Quentin Tarantino is a man who loves movies. And you could tell with his films that he has a strong passion for movies. He loves movies. He loves the things about movies and everything that made movies you know, resonate with people. And he finds actors that share that same passion, the, the people that love the movies he loved, you know, that love a specific movie or the look of a movie. He gets a lot of flack about being like, oh, he's a hack, he's copying this and that. I'm like, well, he's paying homage, and he's found people that have a love for the same thing that he's paying homage to. Like, Kill Bill, both parts one and two, pay homage to about five, six different movies. But he's found people that share the same love he does for the source material that, you know, it's inspired by. Which is why those films are, are so good, because it's not just the director that has a love for that, it's the actress as well. And 
it's not just that they're having fun with it. It's they're they're really enjoying it because they love what they're paying homage to. And I don't know if you're a big um, if you're a big Dario Gento fan or not. I like most of Argento's work. That's pretty much me as an Argento fan too. Like his recent stuff, I just don't talk about. But um, there are two really cool tributes in one in Glorious Bastards and one in Death Proof. And in Death Proof, they do a homage to Bird of the Crystal Plumage, and it's with the with the opening of the movie where in Crystal Plumage you realize very quickly that you're actually watching the scene from the from a stalker's camera as he's taking pictures of the actors. And then they did the same thing in Death Proof. Huh? I definitely need to see Death Proof again then. Because I watched Bird of the Crystal Plumage after I'd watched Death, Death Proof. So I should probably go back and watch Death Proof. Because I love Birds with the Crystal Plumage. That was Argento's first feature. And it's kind of crazy because you look at the fact that, you know, he had written, but I was, I'm a big, I'm a big Argento fan at least of his older work, and I'm looking at it, and I don't see any evidence of him working as a director, and then all of a sudden you look at his first movies and pretty much everything that he's done, and you have this style there that would speak of somebody who had been directing or at least working behind in something other than writing for a long time. Well, he'd been working on films. He, he'd been doing, you know, odd jobs here and there as a PA and things like that. And well, that goes back to what I said about earlier about the best film school is actually working on a film set. Because a lot of the best directors started as people that, you know, they worked as a PA and then they did second unit and things like that. You've got a lot of directors that came from, like, the... Corman school, like Francis Ford Coppola was the second unit director for all of Corman's B-pictures, and that's how Argento came right out of the gate directing a film, because he worked on enough film sets to know what he was doing right out of the right off the bat. Yeah, because he had done a ton of work with uh, Sergio Leone, and I think, to be wrong, but I think he was one of the writers on Once Upon a Time in the West. He might have been. Um, Another big one is Inshiro Honda, who did Godzilla and all of the original kaiju movies. He was a protege of Kurosawa. He was a PA on a lot of Kurosawa movies, so he learned under a great director. And that's why he came right out, just started making great, memorable cinema, because he learned by actually working on a set. It's interesting you mentioned uh, Japanese directors because I was thinking about um, back in high school I had a teacher who he would teach us he would te- go over history and everything with us and then afterwards like you know like the on like a Friday or something he would show us a movie directly correlating to it and unlike a lot of at the time Pearl Harbor came out and he showed the scene from Pearl Harbor and all the I hate to say it I don't want to use the word dumb but a lot of the kids who are not, you know, who didn't appreciate film as much, actually said, "Oh, he should show. He should just show this movie." And he got mad, and he said, "Yeah, this is the only good part about this movie. It's the attack and the fact that it was re- really accurate." And then he went back, and then we went back to watching Tora Tora Tora, which. <laughs> That's about 75% accurate. You get a lot of character moments that probably did not happen. Well, he was just, re- well, he just absolutely, like any right thinking citizen, he just hated Michael Bay. And I think it was just his his excuse to kind of attack Michael Bay in class and then just switch back to Tora Tora Tora. Michael Bay does really good at hard R action movies. Unfortunately, he doesn't get a, a lot of them. Like, could you imagine the Transformers as a hard R? Those would actually be pretty good. Um, look at the work he did on Bad Boys and um, what was that? Pain is Gain? What was that Pain, movie he did? Pain is Gain was awesome, especially when you realize that his version was toned down from the real life version. Yeah, he, he, he can do good work. It's just he's stuck with movies like 
the Transformers and Pearl Harbor. In theory, it could be a great action movie, but then you realize that it only has one action scene. So that's how that movie falls apart. And Michael Bay can do good. He does know what he's doing in the right context. Unfortunately, he's never given the right context to make his movies. The um, the thing that I was actually wanting to touch on in particular with the reference to Tora 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 is that when I – even when I, when I was in high school, I was starting to get into a lot of – that's when I was starting to get into a lot of uh, Asian movies and anime, stuff like that. And I noticed that the Japanese actors in the movie, it didn't feel stereotypical at all. It didn't feel like, oh, it's those evil Japanese. Let's have them all be played by Mickey Rooney. Um, and then later, years later, I start, I watched the movie Battle Royale and I started looking up, um, the director Kinji Fukasaku. Oh, yeah. his name, and realized that he is the director of all the Japanese scenes in Tora Tora Tora. And I thought that was really cool. So did you find out all the other movies that Beat Takeshi did? Beat Tek- oh yeah. Like, um, what is it? The... I didn't realize how far Beat Takeshi's career went back. And, oh, and, and he's mostly known for doing Yakuza movies. Yep. And the I think the earliest one I've seen with him, without realizing it was him right away, was the uh, Merry Christmas? Was it Merry Christmas, uh, Mr. Lawrence? Probably. It's got him and uh, David Bowie, and it's just they're both really, really on. And it took me a second to realize, holy crap, that's Beat Takeshi in the movie with David Bowie. On top of that, Beat Takeshi is also pretty competent as a director. He's directed a few things too. I, I take it you've heard the history of his video game, right? His video game? He hates video games, and he oh. made the most convoluted video game ever just to fuck with people. And it was awesome and glorious. I don't really blame him. I've kind of grown out of video games. The only video games now I play are 10 years old. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't fault him for hating modern video games. This was actually back in the 80s, like 80s and early 90s. Well, he's much older than I am, so again, I don't really fault him for not embracing video games because video games are really for, I don't want to say kids because it's its not necessarily for kids. There are kids' games, but its it's for the under 30 crowd is how I'll phrase it. And I've I've grown out of that, which is why I'm I'm just not into video games. You get to a point in your life where you've got so much going on that you don't have time to devote to a video game. And it's rare for me to actually get into a video game. And I can see that for Beat Takeshi because even in the eighties, you know, oh he's working on all these movies, he's got all these things, you know, he can't get into a video game and he sees all these kids getting into it, kids who do have the time to devote to a video game. And it's not necessarily a hatred, it's just a more of a this is not my thing. I I I can't get into this because of real life, I guess I would say. I just you know, I just think it's really interesting that, you know, even if he was making a video game that was I I don't I, I hate to go and use the the modern term to describe it, but you know, it's interesting that he even though he designed a video game that was just that was designed to troll video gamers, he at the same you know, he at the same at the same time you look at what he's done and just adding making a video game, the list is already over the top of all the things that Takeshi has been able to accomplish. And just having that there is just crazy. What's the name of that movie? Uh, the movie or the the uh, movie? Yeah. Well, no. What's the video game? Rather, I'm sorry. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head, but there was a review from um, the YouTuber Jontron, and I'll find and I'll either I'll find an article on the game. And I'll just shoot that your way, and Thanks. I'll shoot you an, uh, the uh, YouTube video as well. Thank you. So as we bring the show as we bring the show to a close, is there anything else that you want to talk about regarding your website or any work that you're doing? 
Oh, well, you know, I, I want to keep it up. Um, I like not keeping to a schedule because the big thing I want to push with Geek Juice is – well, the biggest thing I push with Geek Juice is you are welcome to have your own opinion because – I see a lot of people on a lot of sites, and they get followers that just they, – they develop a group thing. They're like, this reviewer thought this movie was bad, so this movie must be bad. And they go and they preach the quote-unquote gospel that this is a terrible movie. And what I try to get Geek Juice to do is to give the fact that I feel this is a bad movie. But you are welcome to make your own opinion. And that's the biggest thing is respecting the fact that everybody is going to have their own thought about how a movie is, how a movie resonates with them. And that's the biggest thing that I try to take to review culture is this is how I feel and then asking how do you feel about it. And that's one thing that I'm really trying to do that I feel that makes Geek Juice different is, you know, giving people an, their opportunity to have their own opinion instead of following somebody else's uh, imperative that this movie is bad, so therefore you are bad for liking it. That logic I do not stand. Yeah, because it makes sense that, you know, you want to, that something that anybody's into film should want to discuss it, should want to talk about it. Like, I have a lot of people on my page who sometimes they'll talk, they'll ask me, oh, you just post a picture or state something on your page, but you don't generally tend to follow up on it a lot on the comments. Like, I very rarely touch the uh, comments. I just allow people to talk about it without telling somebody, oh, you're wrong. Oh, you're right. And for me, you know, like yourself, I'm a big, big fan of movies, but I want to hear other people's opinions more than I would want to talk about my own. So I'll kind of get people started and just let them go from there. Years, years ago, I took a, a court ordered anger management class, and that's a story for some other day. And the biggest thing I took from that, that that 52 weeks was never start a sentence with you. Always start a sentence with I. And that's what I've, how I've approached reviewing film is starting sentences with I feel this movie this, I feel this movie that versus you suck for hating this movie. If you like this movie, you know, it's starting sentences with I leave people think leave things open to interpretation. It lets people know that I'm presenting my opinion. I'm not telling you how to think. That makes a lot more sense. And, you know, it allows people to do it, to do what they should be doing and just communicate with each other on something they enjoy. It's not about, and we've really steered away from using the word review. On Geek Juice, um, if you if you notice on our Facebook, you'll see that things always pop up as, you know, Alex Jowski and Charlie and Mike or whomever discusses. It's it's a discussion of a movie. It's an introduction to a movie that we don't really review movies as much as we discuss the movie and what it means to a whole. Reviewing is left to a different party. Well, we'll present our opinion, but it's not an end-all opinion. That's a big thing that I did with Geek Juice is I'm like, I'm not going with ratings. I'm not going to do, you know, five stars or, you know, whatever out of ten ratings. I want people to present opinions, not ratings. That's definitely a good way to go about it. Well, um, as we bring the show to a close, I just wanted to say thanks for coming on the show. And it was a lot of fun to bring you on, man. And if we do any other movie shows, movie or film shows, because we have a regular film series, hopefully it wouldn't mind if we invite you on for those. Oh, definitely. Just let me know. I, I'm i usually available on Sundays. That's my day off, so I should be available Sunday evenings usually. Awesome. And with that, that brings us to the close of our newest episode of Circuit 42 Presents. 
and you have a good night, everybody, and keep watching movies or the um sh or the shark or the the or the Katy Perry shark on Jassy's picture will come kill you. Oh, is that what I have right now? Oh yeah, I've got the Katy Perry shark. <laughs>